Hey guys, welcome to Taking Stock, the Caribbean's number one business and finance show. I'm Khalila Reynolds, and if you want all the latest news and views about your money, you're in the right place. But before we get started, make sure you subscribe to my newsletter at KhalilaReynolds.com. I've got some exclusive stuff coming for my newsletter peeps, so you definitely want to be on that list. You can click the link up here or in the description box below. Now come on, let's get this money! First up, is Uber really coming to Jamaica? The US ride-hailing service recently invited Jamaican drivers to sign up on its app, but the transport authority says they don't have permission. As far as I'm aware, Uber has not been granted any approval to operate public transportation services in Jamaica. The transport authority is not in receipt of any applications from Uber for that service. And later, the analysts swing on the latest market developments. With Uber's planned expansion into countries like Jamaica, is the tech company a buy for investors? I would not recommend for any investor to overly expose their self into this particular stock. Meanwhile, financial institutions have gotten the green light to resume full dividend payments. What does it mean for your pocket? It means now with this allowance from the Bank of Jamaica, it means that those persons who had in excess of 1% are now able to re receive those dividends that were declared from last year or for dividends for 2019. We'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. QuickBooks can now connect to three Jamaican banks. QuickBooks is a popular accounting software geared towards small and medium-sized businesses. It can be used for bookkeeping, invoicing, paying bills, and preparing taxes. The company sent an email to its Jamaican customers last week, notifying them that they can now connect their CIBC First Caribbean, NCB, or Scotiabank accounts to the software. This will save users hours in reconciling accounts, since this will now be automatic. Several Jamaicans on social media have applauded the move. Jamaicans abroad sent home almost 40% more money in January than they did a year earlier in 2020. According to data from the Bank of Jamaica, net remittance inflows increased by 63 million US dollars at the top of the year. This means family and friends in the diaspora sent back roughly 224 million US. That's also 3 million US more than they sent in November 2020. Between April 2020 and January 2021, Jamaicans abroad sent home 2.4 billion US dollars in total. 70% of the remittances in January came from the United States. Roughly 12% came from the UK. Canada contributed 9% and the Cayman Islands close to 6%. Remittances are one of Jamaica's largest sources of US dollars. It contributes significantly to GDP through the foreign exchange market. Pension experts have welcomed the Bank of Jamaica's move to increase how much they are allowed to invest in foreign exchange instruments. The FX cap was increased from 7.5% to 10% on April 1. The experts say it will help to strengthen the sector as it allows them to further diversify their assets. President of the Pension Industry Association of Jamaica, Sanya Goff, says this will help them hedge against the impact of depreciation in the Jamaican dollar and inflation. She says it will also deliver an increase in foreign exchange gains. The BOJ regulation allows for investments to be made in foreign currency instruments issued by the Jamaican government or issued or guaranteed by the governments of the US, UK and Canada. JN Fund Managers has raised $1.4 billion on the local capital market. They issued two fixed-rate notes to institutional and accredited investors. The funds were raised in two tranches. The first was an $800 million note with a fixed rate of 6.25% for two years. The other involved a $600 million offer of a five-and-a-half-year note upsizable to $1 billion. The first tranche was fully subscribed, while a take-up of $669 million was received in the second tranche. JN Fund Managers says the successful issue will provide the company with resources for its continued growth. Career banker Morris Nelson has been promoted to Scotiabank's Senior Vice President SVP of Corporate and Commercial Banking. He takes over from Perrin Gale, who will now lead Scotia's retail and small business banking operations. Nelson has been at Scotiabank for 32 years. Before this promotion, he was Vice President for Commercial Banking, with responsibility for commercial and mid-market business. He's also held several other leadership roles at BNS. 
Scotia Group President and CEO Audrey Tugwell Henry says Nelson has been integral to the growth of their commercial banking portfolio. He now has the executive responsibility for the continued growth of the business segment. What's Hot was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. When we come back, Uber has disrupted the transportation industry in many major markets. Will it do the same in Jamaica? We'll discuss. Hey, money makers, you're not an official part of the family until you have your merch. Visit KhalilaReynolds.com store to order your t-shirt and your mask today. Let's get this money. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency, insurance made easy, and Massey United Insurance. How good is your insurance? Welcome back to Taking Stock. If you're 21 and over, check. Own a 2010 vehicle or newer, check. And have a valid driver's license and registration, check. You could soon start earning some extra cash as an Uber driver right here in Jamaica. According to a recent statement from Uber, it's that easy. But is it really? Joining us now, our Corporate Communications Manager at the Transport Authority, Petra Keen Williams, and President of the Jamaica Association of Transport Owners and Operators, Jatu, Louis Barton. Hi, Petra Keen. Hi, Louis. Thanks for joining me. Hi, morning. Hi good morning. Thank you for having me. So the big talk has been about Uber coming to Jamaica. You would have seen they even sent out a press release uh, telling people that they can download the app and apply to become a driver. Petra Keen, is there any regulation for a company like Uber? Is the Transport Authority involved at all? Okay, definitely. The Transport Authority has to be involved in this process. Uh, the truth about it is that Uber would be providing public transportation services. And what that means is that the operators would be required to have road licenses and badges in order to provide that service. So hold on, when you when you say the operators would be required to have road licenses, do you mean all the drivers who sign up with Uber or just the company overall? All drivers who sign up with Uber will be required to have um, public passenger vehicle licenses oh. and badges. That is what the legislative framework for Jamaica speaks to, the Road Traffic Act and the Transport Authority Act. Oh, do you know if that's how it works in, in other jurisdictions where they operate? I believe in some of the other Caribbean countries, they've had that same challenge entering the market. I'm not sure that it's it would be the same thing um, in some of the larger countries like US or say in Europe. But for Jamaica, definitely, the operators are required to be licensed as public passenger vehicles and the drivers of the units are required to have badges. Oh, wow. Okay. So that right there might be a disincentive for Jamaican drivers who might want to sign up because now you have to go through this process to get licensed. Uh, how difficult is that process or how easy is it? <laughs> well, okay. To, to become a public passenger vehicle operator, it's not difficult, but it is a very detailed process because, of course, you'll be transporting, you know, the commuting public. And so the transport authority has to do its due diligence to ensure that you can provide that service. So part of what is required is that you would make an application to the transport authority. You'd be required to do a police report, pay the requisite processing fees have the vehicle checked by the Island Traffic Authority to ensure that it's suitable to enter the public transportation sector. And so you'd have to complete an L form. There's also another inspection that is done by the Transport Authority for um, items such as, you know, your fire extinguisher, markings, and um, so on. And so there are a few steps well to getting that done. We hope that all the drivers who are signing up on that app are cognizant of what the laws of the land say and what they will be required to do to operate legal public transportation services. Mm. But does the, the company itself, Uber, have to go through the Transport Authority or the Ministry of Transport to get approval? Or is it just a thing where individual drivers can do what you just said? Well, if Uber is intending to operate um, in the way I believe they are intending to, then they would need to get some sort of approval for their model, which is a ride-sharing model. 
I know they had reached out to the Ministry of Transport in 2017 and a technical team had reviewed Uber's proposal. Uber has several permutations of how it operates in different jurisdictions. The one that we're most familiar with is a ride sharing where, you know, you get um, private owners to sign up to this app and then they do their own screening and they track and so on. But there's Uber X, I believe, and another form of Uber that um, where the persons would operate with licenses. What we, I believe, what the recommendation from the Ministry of Transport and Mining was that Uber would, it would be best suited for Uber to uh, engage like local operators and operate in the same context of a, as a hackney carriage company. I see. So for that, they would need approval. Have they gotten that approval yet? As far as I'm aware, Uber has not been granted any approval to operate public transportation services in Jamaica. The Transport Authority is not in receipt of any applications from Uber for that service. Oh, and so that would come directly to you. So you would know. Yes, we would know if they have made an application to operate as a Hackney Carriage company or some permutation of that. And we would also know if they're making applications for licenses because we would process the licenses. We have received no no applications um, in that regard. Oh, wow. So it would seem to me that that statement by them that they are coming here is premature. Well, you could put it that way. <laughs> oh, this is interesting. It's not what I was expecting to hear. Well, Louis Barton, let me bring you in here as a, a transport operator. Uh, what is your reaction to Uber wanting to operate here? As far as the Uber is com coming in is concerned, we as transport operators see this as competition, but competition is not always um, a bad thing. Because for one thing, um, Uber is introducing a technology that can only be advantageous to Jamaica. The, the, the present um, taxi service companies that operate in Jamaica, I think it's just an a Uber type service that they have without the technology, that international technology that is necessary. And what I would like to see, and, and we discussed it in Jatu, what we would like to see is that the development, our development, the local taxi association transport companies, all of them have access to the international market because that is what Uber brings to us. They are able to, to bring somebody from New York, that person in New York or in London or Japan, they could make a reservation for a taxi service in Jamaica. We don't mind that competition because that is like a new technology coming in to Jamaica. What we are hoping for is that this technology will come in and help us to advance. It is, I consider it is the payment. Uh, my thing is that it is a payment that we have to make for getting to a third world status for transportation needs in Jamaica. So we don't mind the competition as long as the playing fields are level. Mm. You know, well, I um, go ahead, Petra Keen. Right. I wouldn't want us to believe that um, Uber is bringing something no, too, too sure novel to the table because there are entities in Jamaica now that provide Uber tax services. So 876 on the go, get there and ride Jamaica have been doing that kind of service where they have an international link and they do the bookings online and all of that. So I think what we have to recognize is that some of it is already here. I think there has been resistance sometimes from the local operators to embrace new technology in the whole operations of their their you know their their vehicles and their business. And what we have to start to do now is to to be open to technology and how we can use technology to advance the sector. So I'm in agreement with Mr. Barton, but I also wanted to be clear that there are some local players who are already doing some of what Uber has has been doing. Yeah, and I believe that they, they modeled their services off Uber as well. But Louis, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised to hear your take on it because my immediate thought was, oh, the taxi drivers are going to be against this because it's competition. Mm -hmm. and, and not only that, but in other markets where Uber operates, they have largely displaced members of your industry. So other taxi yeah. services, they've taken over a lot of those jobs and, and, and many taxi men end up just driving for Uber 
instead. And there is a, yeah. a difference in the fares that are charged and the percentage that Uber takes. So what are your thoughts on that aspect of it? Well, the, the competition is, a, is something that a number of operators will oppose. But after, there is a, 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 after the Uber comes in and if they're operating, I don't think it will affect us negatively because we are confident. And the operators who work in Jamaica, they are confident of their type of operation. They, are, they have their own customers, despite it being not as technologically advanced as one with Uber. But we have operators who, um, in, the, in the Kingston area, they pick up their passengers at their home. They take their children to school. They put the keys in their door. There's a personal relationship that exists in Jamaica uh, transportation sector. And, and, and that personal relationship that exists now for us, I think Uber is trying to create that, or probably has tried to create that on a technological level. So we can advance technologically to that position where Uber is, or Uber can come down to our level where they can have relationship with our passengers. So I don't fear the competition. I really believe that it can advance us. Some of our, some of our drivers might even go over to Uber, but it, it, it is not, as long as the drivers benefit, that's all I'm saying. And, and, and I believe that the sector will not be affected negatively by Uber coming in. We already have a driver shortage in Jamaica. So there won't be much movement from the independent operators now to Uber service or, or vice versa. I, I really don't see it having a great impact on our business. It's something we just have to adjust over the long run. Mm, I, I find that to be a very optimistic position given what has happened mm. in other markets. But what it yeah. will do is force you to step up your game to offer more professional service. I do take your point that, that many drivers have a personal relationship with their passengers. So you have your taxi man who you always call and you're gonna continue calling him. And yeah. you have the, the ones who take the kids to school. That is a personal relationship that cannot be replaced by technology. There are several concerns, as you would well be aware of, having private persons provide public transportation services without the government screening taking place. We want our commuters to be safe. We want them to be protected. And we want to ensure that their rights are protected. We at the Transport Authority, we welcome all newcomers to the market, right? We believe that the more persons that can come in and up the service delivery or up the services, that helps to improve the sector. But what we want is for persons to operate legally and to ensure that what they do is in line with the protection of the commuting public. So if they don't do that, they'd essentially be a, a robot taxi then? You could put it that way. They would be operating illegal transportation services. Well, it's a white plate because they don't have red plates for, <laughs> for ride share. Right. I would put a red plate on my car. It would be a white plate. Yes. And so uh, if you operate illegally, Ill illegal public transportation services, then you would face prosecution. Oh. Oh. So it means that our teams would prosecute you because one, you wouldn't have PPV insurance. You wouldn't have a road license and the driver would not have a badge. So we couldn't accommodate that in the system. As you can how would, how you know. would you be able to know that somebody is operating as an Uber driver though? Because the thing is that the bookings are done via the app. Passengers look like ordinary people. The cars are ordinary cars. How would your officers be able to tell that somebody is using, is operating as an Uber? Well, the Transport Authority does different types of operations. I think people are very familiar with seeing our teams on the road, but that is just one part of what we do. We have covert operations and we will get the information. I can guarantee you that we will do what it takes to ensure the safety and protection of the commuting public. And we do covert operations. And so that would be part of the strategy. But of course, we would prefer not to go that route. We would prefer for Uber to operate legally, to approach us the right way and to do the thing the right way. That is what we would expect of Uber. Mm -hmm. Petra Keen, would the Transport Authority be involved in regulating fares for Uber as well? Because the fares, F-A-R-E-S, 
that's another big issue and a competitive advantage that they bring because they tend to be cheaper than using a regular taxi service. Well, definitely the Transport Authority and the Ministry of Transport would regulate the fares based on the legislative framework. Uber would not be able to um, charge as they do in other jurisdictions. So um, they would be required to be subjected to the reg regulatory, um, the pricing thresholds here in Jamaica. So that's something else that we had raised with Uber's team at the time when they had approached us. Mm, so they wouldn't be able to charge less. They would have to charge the same standard rates that regular taxi service charges. Right, basically. Ah, oh, interesting. So another another plus in your corner, Louis, another reason why yeah, you're hearing this competition. Right. I don't mind. As, as I said, as long as we're on the a level playing field, then we're okay. We, and we like the competition because it can only improve the whole sector. The whole Jamaican economy um, it has proven that it has benefited from benefited from um, from technology and from from competition. So we we are we have no fear. It can only improve even even the the, the idea of what people call the indiscipline of transport operators. I believe that this will be improved with the introduction of Uber because the operators will be able to see that a technology is coming that can replace them. And those who are bad behaving, uh, we have a few of them, um, they will be, we're hoping that they will be weeded out. And, and, and I just have to mention that there's a kind of new trend in the Transport Authority that, we're, that we, at least we are working together with them. And, and it can be done. It, we are hopeful. And we, we really, really, really feel confident that something of benefit can come out of this. Whether who overcome in, are are not the improvement that are that, that we forecast that we see on the horizon can only be beneficial to jamaica mm -hmm. and as you mentioned the technology petra Keen also mentioned earlier about the the safety issue why the drivers need to be vetted i've used uber before in the united states when i've, I've traveled and one of the things that i was really impressed with is the vehicle traffic uh, the vehicle tracking so they are able to use the app to track at any time where that car is on the route uh, so you always know and if somebody else, if you're sending the information to a loved one, they can track where exactly you are. And an issue that we have had here in Jamaica is, you know, that very concern about safety, especially for women. We saw the example recently of Canice Jackson, who, you know, because of her fears about public transportation, she thought it was safer to take a ride with this person who she developed a friendship with. And there have been many other instances in the past of, of women just being afraid of taking taxis, taking public transportation because of that fear of being abducted, of being raped. And Uber brings with it this technology that you're able to, to track. Now, Louis, for the local operators, is this something that you'd be open to? You spoke about technology improving the overall environment, but what about you all uh, starting to use this type of technology yourselves? Is there any work being put into that? I know that it's, it would be a significant investment. Well, one of the requirements presently is that the Transport Authority wants all operators to have a tracking system. Right? You have a number of operators who are opposed to it, but I, I personally believe that it is good. The, the, the problems that they, the, those who oppose it have is that they see no need, based on their operation, they see no need for the Transport Authority to know where they are at any one time. Hmm. But some of these, some of these pe same people who oppose the tracking system by the Transport Authority, they have a tracking system of their own in their system on their, uh, you know, for their own private They don't want Transport use. Authority to see the bad driving. That's exactly no, what yeah. it is. Very it good. Be, Very good. That, that, well, that is a to see the bad no, driving. That's why they don't want the tracking. No, no, no. Uh, the, 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 the transport bad. authority wouldn't be able to see the bad driving because I mean okay. I am yes, not defending bad driving. But no, you'd be able on to what see, I have. think, the speed of the no. car and that type of thing, wouldn't you? Right. Yeah. This, okay. Well, all of these, all of these, <laughs> have to be pointed out to us so that we can come on board because our 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 main thing is to have 
a proper and decent transportation system for our passengers. We're looking out for our passengers more than anything else. You have some recalcitrant and drivers who do some crazy things on the road. Um, but we are not defending that. What we want is a good system for Jamaica. Now, I, I don't know, based on the operation in KMTR, in the Kingston metropolitan area, if I am driving a taxi and I'm behaving bad on the road, I don't know if the transport authority will see me behaving bad. Because as of now, we are required to keep the information about our tra traveling traveling. Um, going around for at least four weeks. So you might not have access, our transport authority might not have access to the information for a good four weeks if they do want it. You know? but, but what I, I would be advocating is that all operators be part of a system where they can be tracked. And just like how Uber is being tracked, I mean, track their people, the, the, the different companies could do the same and provide a safe transportation system for Jamaica. I mean, there, there is need for improvement, and I think the technology will do it. And having Uber come in, I, I, I am saying it will be a, 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 a jerk towards um, having a better system. Mm. Uh, I'm <laughs> <to> me. <laughs> Right. So when we introduced tracking and we did a lot of consultations and I, it's something I'm very disappointed about in terms of the resistance that we got from public passenger vehicle operators, because I thought it would have done more harm than good for them. And it would have put their more service. More good than harm. Right. Um, and they would have put their service delivery at such a high level that they would have been, you know, it would just have transformed the sector. Um, we had done several consultations with the operators and the proposed system would have been one centralized tracking system that would have all the public passenger vehicles on it. And there would be a mechanism where the transport authority would only monitor exception reports. So uh, we wouldn't be monitoring each individual operator to see where they go and what they do per se, but it, we would have parameters that would monitor exceptions and then there would also be the opportunity to be able to access this information in the case where people go missing where people are abducted and we've we've had a few um reports of this well you know where persons have been abducted raped robbed and so on the next level to that is something that we will be introducing at the end of april um and it's called travel pal it's a, it's an app that allows you to I, uh, you know, scan the license plate of the vehicle and determine whether or not it's a licensed public passenger vehicle. And it will also name or show you the, the driver, the approved driver, that's the driver with the badge. And then you can share your journey with your, with your family member. And I mean, that's where the authority wanted to take it. That's, that's how we were thinking of it. Of course, stakeholder ban and support sometimes is challenging when you do not have the legislative framework um, existing to you know have that thing implemented and so we got a lot of uh, resistance from the operators and i thought that you know it was just a unique opportunity to take the service delivery in jamaica to the highest level and we missed that opportunity i hope that they'll come around and see the benefits of having an integrated and a centralized tracking mechanism because at the end of the day what is it that we desire do we desire to move people safely and securely you know protecting the commuting public and also have our business flourish then if that's what they are you know interested in let's look at the technology let's look at how things can be done and not look at the transport authority as always just seeking to be adversarial or trying to seize your vehicle the transport authority's role goes far beyond that we are the regulators and monitors of public transportation our intent is to have safe, secure, reliable public transportation services that you, Kalila, or any Jamaican would be comfortable using. And that is where we want it to go. I would mm. love to see that come to fruition. That app sounds like a great idea, Petra Keen. But before um, we go, though, so, so let's wrap up the discussion on, on Uber. So you said that they have not submitted an application to the Transport Authority just yet. For, for argument's sake, if that application was to come across your desk or your boss's desk today and everything was in order, what would be the soonest uh, they would be able to begin operations? How long might that take? 
Well, I can't say because we don't know, we don't have any details. And um, a lot of what will be required is the details. We need to know the, the vehicles involved, the, the owners of the vehicle. It's a process and it wouldn't be something that would happen overnight in terms of an approval. And as I said, it would have to be within the existing legislative framework. So we wouldn't be making an exception to the rule to, to allow that service to continue or to be established. So is that unlikely for 2021? I couldn't say at this time because we don't know what what Uber wants to do at this stage. So they reached out to, to us in 2017 and we really haven't had haven't any heard from them since then. I think the last communication with Uber based on information I've received from the ministry was in 2018 and we're now wow. in 2021. So whatever was discussed at that time, we can't take it for granted that that is what they are re requesting to do now. And I think it is the responsible thing for an entity or an organization enter, entering a new market to respect the regulations and guidelines of that new market. And let us have um, you know, a system that works efficiently for all. The Transport Authority, as I said, we are open to newcomers coming into the market. We believe competition adds value if it is done in an appropriate way. Well, we look uh, forward to, to whatever happens. Louis, this also gives you and your members time to, to step up your game too. Yes, at least will, it will give us a chance to know what they are coming in to do. And what I would like to happen is that um, while they are applying or trying to get in, I, I would like somebody, probably the Transport Authority, to explain to the drivers, to everybody, what is coming and what the competition will be. I don't think that's the Transport Authority's job to do. We need, I, I don't know, somebody have to tell us. You know, some time ago, they introduced 10,000 new licenses all of a sudden, and that caused a catastrophe in, within the sector. Uh, if you're going to bring in a significant amount of operators, a new player, a new system, um, then you need to explain to the existing um, players in the system how it will f affect them. All right. Mm, I think we have to look at it as a business. And if we apply the principles of business, then I think we would not really be where you are, Mr. Barton. But let's let's we will continue our dialogue. As you know, we are open to having discussions with you and we look forward to hearing from you. Um, but as I said, we have to operate things as a business and look at it from that perspective. And let's um, cross that bridge when we reach it too. Thanks, yes. Petra Kim. Thanks, Louis. Okay, you're welcome, and thank you very much yeah. for having us. Up next, we've got your market recap, and the analysts are standing by. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency, Insurance Made Easy, and Massey United Insurance. How good is your insurance? Time now for your market recap, brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. The Jamaica Stock Exchange declined with the combined index losing less than 1%. 103 stocks traded across both the main and junior markets of the JSC for the week ending Friday, April 9, 2021. 48 advanced, 38 declined, and 17 stayed the same. 6 to 7 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling nearly $302 million. Wigton Wind Farm Ordinary Shares traded the most, taking up nearly 22% of market volume. The stock gained 2 cents to open the week at 65 cents. Jamaican teas traded at the second highest, with people buying and selling 8 million shares in the company. The stock lost 17 cents to open this week at $3.03. .03. And a Trans-Jamaican Highway rounded out the most traded, taking up 9% of market volume. The stock lost 3 cents to close last week at $1.35. Now let's see who had the biggest gains. Caribbean cream nearly rose 25% to close last week at $6.36. CAC 2000 9.5% cumulative redeemable preference shares came in second for last week's biggest gains, with its stock rising 20%. The stock opens this new week at $1.38. And rounding off the biggest gains, Express Catering stock advanced 18% to open this week at $4.78. On the losing side now, Iron Rock Insurance Company's stock fell at 20% to close last week at $2.88. 
Salada Foods Jamaica stock fell 15% last week, down to $5.19. Rounding off the biggest losers, 1834 Investments, which lost nearly 11%, to open this week at $1. Market Recap was brought to you by Sajikor Investments. Think wealth, think Sajikor Investments. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Ideal Portfolio Services. Welcome back to Taking Stock. I've got a team of analysts to examine the week in business. I'm joined by Senior Wealth Advisor at Ideal Portfolio Services, Auric Angus, and Research and Strategy Analyst at Sagicor Investments, Jody Ann Aris. Hi, Auric. Hi, Jody Ann. Star Hi. girl, Jody Ann, big presenter. You did yeah. well, Jody. I hope you guys are both very rested from the Easter holiday. I am. Yes. I am very yes. rested. <laughs> Okay, good. So we've been off for the past week, but we're now back. And one of the hot topics in Jamaica now is about Uber coming to Jamaica. Are they really coming? That's the big question. So they sent out a press release, but we've heard from the Ministry of Transport. And we've heard some other objections from the taxi associations. Uh, it seems that there's still some things to iron out. But Auric, I know that you follow the international stock markets. What is Uber looking like right now? Is it a buy? Um, yeah, so that's, that has been the big, biggest question I've been coming across recently since that, that press release. Um, as we said, we don't know if they're coming yet, um, but we'll see. But um, in the midst of the pandemic, with a lot of persons being forced to stay home um, throughout that time period, the company revenue has suffered from that at an average 11% um, year over year. The good news is that you, Uber's service is not entirely dependent on the mobility of individuals to use of, of their taxi services. They have two other main business segments, which has been a space that competition has significantly seen increasing to their food delivery services, which is called Uber Eats, and their shipping um, service, which is called Uber Freight. So those two business segments has been the main driver for the company's revenue uh, revenue performance since the coronavirus. The overall revenue though, it, the, it has not been so well, but it just goes to show that, it, that diversification is important in any business. Um, the growth right now is organic. The, the, the gross margins are somewhere around 53%, which is still healthy. Net margins are negative. Um, what's concerning, well, it's not a bit of a concern to me right now, but if the pandemic prolongs, then that will be something that we really need to look into. And that is the company's debt margin has grown to almost $10 billion, which is 9.9 to be exact. Like I say, it is not an alarming figure right now, but if, that con if the pandemic continues to linger, then that will be a major check to the company. In terms of the, the valuation, it is a non-profitable stock right now with negative cash flow. Cash flow. So, so one might wonder why if we're recommending a buy for this company and why we'd be doing that. Um, I think yes, that, tell me why. <laughs> yeah, I think based on the metrics that I've looked at, at a price to book ratio of eight times in comparison to their competitors, which is around 12 times, I still think there is value. Uber is still the better option right now. I think there's more reach. The company um, operates in over 10,000 cities across 71 countries. They have, they have the biggest market share in the industry in which they operate. Um, the, the cash flow is negative, but I would not recommend for any investor to overly expose their self into this particular stock. It is one that you can, you can, it is a, you can put a small percentage of that stock in a well diversified portfolio. That's my opinion. It is, it has long term growth opportunities. The company is still in a growth stage. So I'm hoping that knock on wood at the end of the pandemic. Um, things will start to turn around for them. Clearly, they are indeed in a growth stage. They are moving to 
new and different markets such as Jamaica, they're targeting uh, coming here. I'm not sure where else they might be looking at as well. Uh, Jody Ann, uh, <clears throat> based on things that, I, I don't know, have, have either of you used Uber before when you've traveled? I've used it once. No, you I've use it, used... Jody Ann? No. I've, I've used it. Is it something that you would be interested in using, Jody Ann? Um, well, I think particularly, what we'd, what I'd want to say in terms of the dynamics of our transportation system, how, how well it would fit in. Um, I'm not sure what, exactly what platform it is that they're coming with. Is it to take a position with, you know, the local, for example, on-time taxes that you have? Is it that they are going to include them in the system or is it going to be a competing edge towards them? So it would very much depend on how it plays in the, the dynamics of the transportation sector. Um, for me, you know, before to see how well it would work here, you know, we'd have to do a little bit more deep digging on that. But I mean, in terms of how we, how I've seen it work in other eras, I mean, I wouldn't be averse to it. Just to add to mm -hmm. that, I think the platform that the that Uber creates is it's more self-driven, so you really don't need like an on-time taxes on time company that right, that's what i'm saying if it is that those persons would then become a part of uber or is it you know they signed up uber, so it's more so we want to see how it's yeah how it would fit within the dynamic or is it that you know those persons would want to stay as themselves and be more of a competition to uber so we'd have to see how right. it plays. Yeah, because we've seen we've seen in other markets where they have displaced uh, a large yeah. portion of the, the taxi industry that that section of the transportation industry and 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 a cost is also important because I believe Uber gets thirty percent of the 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 revenue that each driver makes. So it's it's all comes down to what that thirty percent works out to. Is it feasible for their business? And and if um, drivers will be willing to pay that amount, because thirty percent is very big. It can be a, a bit of a sum if you if you really match it out, you know. Yeah, so it depends on, so if you are signing up, Auric, as you're not a taxi driver, you just might be interested in, in doing the ride share to make a little extra income on the side, it might not bother you so much to pay the 30%, right. but for somebody who this is their bread and butter, right. this is their day-to-day -day main job, then that yeah. becomes an issue. And you know, funny enough, my one experience was when I, when I got picked up in, in Florida, it was an investment banker, so it was so funny. <laughs> Look at that. I've used it several times when I traveled. So in I went to Miami, the last time I went to Miami, I used it several times. Um, and I found it to be, so my main concern before I used it for the first time was safety. And, yeah. But then I realized once you're on the app, the app tracks you, it tracks the driver. They mm -hmm. are, I feel like it's safer than using a regular taxi service mm -hmm. because of that technology they know at all times where the car is how far it is on the route right. it seems to be safer right there's more tracking mm -hmm. and it, that's safety concern in our in our local transportation industry especially for women taking public Very transportation important. right fully support it has a lot of cool features and um obviously it, it is traveling in social distancing style so that that's good while the pandemic is still still around what i think is going to to happen maybe five six years from now is that the vehicle will become vehicles will probably become autonomous so the hundred percent of those revenues will be going directly to the company versus having a driver but Obviously, there are regulatory requirements for that right now until the company can manage to, to, to battle those regulations as they come forth, then we'll see how that goes. But that's where I see this company heading in the future. You know, that's my prediction too, not just for Uber, but I think autonomous vehicles will become a mainstream thing within the next maybe 20 years or so we'll start seeing that that major transition to autonomous driving and then uh, taxi drivers may become obsolete entirely taxi drivers yeah. bus drivers that entire industry i actually don't mind it because we've seen in the past with other industries when one thing takes over when one thing becomes automated those skills become repurposed over time though it doesn't happen immediately and other jobs 
fill the space. We find other things to do with our time. So we might, when computer, when computers used to actually be a person, a human being, I don't know if you watch Hidden Figures, people used to be the ones who manually computed everything. Right. Now we have computers to do everything else. And, and it's actually made us more productive, even though we don't have those specific jobs anymore. Mm -hmm. But let's look at some news on the local market. So dividends. The Bank of Jamaica has announced that we will now have full resumption of dividend payments. jodi what's your take? So this is actually some good news. Um, what it is is that they have really had other discussions indicate that they are now allowing for, you know, some of the financial companies to now extend payments beyond just the persons who held less than 1% in terms of overall holdings in financial companies. So this is actually bringing some good news. Um, just to point out that it is in line with what's happening in the global markets. I know the Federal Reserve has indicated that they plan to end their temporary restrictions on banks about in the first half of 2021. Um, just to remind us that you know the restrictions are really precautionary. It wasn't that because the banks were in any particular, you know, deep weaknesses where you know there had to be these restrictions. It's just in the event that things got really, really bad, they wanted to you know make sure that banks and stuff had. A buffer or a cash allowance. Um, I think the good news that it brings, you know, even more so is that it's it's not just for persons, for companies that would have declared dividends. So if you think of like a Sajikura or a JMB that would have declared dividend, dividends last year and they were only able to distribute to those persons who had holdings of less than 1%. It means now with this allowance from the Bank of Jamaica, it means that those persons who had in excess of 1%, are now able to receive those dividends that were declared from last year or for dividends for 2019. So that brings some good news. So if you think of a company like a Panjam that has, you know, ownership in Sachikur and they are about 30% ownership in Sachikur share, you know, in terms of shares, they are now able, I mean, having Sachikur not pay them dividend last year really affected their cash flow. So it brings good news, not just for you know, persons who hold the stocks, but for other listed companies that have ownership in some of these financial companies that are listed on the market. Um, another thing that I noticed is, you know, there has been a little bit of a dip in terms of the price for NCB, you know, having from there and decided that they are not going to consider a dividend, you know, for first quarter, even in light of the fact that BOJ has given allowance that they could. Um, and it brings, you know, you notice a little bit of, fall off in their price, you know, which is really investors looking on and, you know, having had a full year of not getting dividend or not as, you know, or they are putting that within the valuation for the stock. Um, I think from their end, you know, on the other side of it is that they are really one of the, they are really the larger bank. And if you look at market share, they are about 35% of the overall deposit taking market. And as such, you know, their exposure is a little bit much higher than other banks. And so they may still be wanting to play it a little bit more conservative based on, you know, their loan book. Um, I really do think, though, that as we come into the second half of the year, that the, a company like an NCB will probably start mm -hmm. to, you know, make some sort of dividend declaration. But overall, it's generally good news for the financial companies that have been a little bit depressed, you know, because of the fact that, you know, they have not been able to declare dividends, you know, to every or to distribute dividends to everyone, even though they have declared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Auric Jodian made a, a good point about who is affected because many people have heard this announcement and say, oh, it only affected the really big guy because how many people really have more than 1% holding in any yeah. company, in any institution? But when you look at the fact that there are companies like Panjam that she, she cited that are affected by this, and then if you're a shareholder of Panjam by extension, then you're also mm -hmm. affected then yeah. it's it's not just about oh yeah. it's the big guy getting their dividend. Yeah, I mean, Jolly, another thing yeah. to note is the pension funds that you know probably would have had some liquidity issues because yeah. there are some of the big holders in some of these companies. Um, and a lot of persons would have noticed their pension revaluing, you know, based on the fact you know financial assets dipping last year, and so it gives them a little bit of cash liquidity to do anything that they have probably wanted to do last year that they couldn't have been able to do. Right, so Jody has bring up some very good points there and some very good reminders. So, so even ideal, ideal portfolio services, we have large stakes in yeah. NCD, Magicor, and Scotia. So our revenues have been affected by the non 
um, paying out a dividend. Mm-hmm. Pension funds have been affected. Okay. Other and funds, other funds that, are right. accredited investors. So it's even though the smaller persons have been getting their dividends, these larger shareholders have been really affected over the last year. So it is definitely good news for them. Um, cash flows are coming in now so they can up on back on their IRs and buy um, put cash where it's supposed to go. Um, yeah. I do see some of that cash will be coming back into the market as well. But we also have to be mindful, as Jody mentioned before, that um, it's a consideration. So a company choose to declare dividends and yeah. how much they want to declare. So as I'm looking at the figures, um, most companies would have reduced the amount they paid out in dividends um, from the previous year, 2019, um, 2020, you know. So I don't expect those figures will go back um, to where they were in 2019, there about. I don't expect to see any special dividend dividend pay, payout as yet, like what Scotia did in 2019. I did, yeah. But I, I do. I do foresee a gradual um, increase over time as we try to to come out of, of the, the pandemic. Yeah. It's good overall, to, to, see, to see that, yeah. And overall, it is a good sign, as, as Jody Ann mentioned, a sign mm-hmm. of confidence in the economy. The BOJ mm-hmm. did note that the, the financial institutions have weathered the storm fairly yeah. well, and, you know, which is one of the reasons they're allowing dividends to fully resume once again. Thanks for your input all the time. Jody Ann, Auric, yeah. always good having you. Cheers. All right, take care. Bye-bye. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, was brought to you by Ideal Portfolio Services. That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel and share with a friend. Also subscribe to our newsletter at kalilareynolds.com and turn on those post notifications so that you can be the first to see all my other features. We want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. This week on Money Mondays JA, we're talking about something no one really wants to talk about. That's estate planning. I'll tell you how to write your own will. And on Money Moves JA, applications are now open for the DBJ's Ignite grant. You can receive up to $7 million for your business. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kalila Ray and follow at Taking Stock JA on Instagram. If you want to connect with the analysts this week, check the description box below for their contact information. Also visit our website, kalilareynolds.com for financial information you can use however you like it. Watch, listen, or read. Now tell a friend about taking stock. Investing is the new sexy. So let's make it cool to talk about money. I'm Kalila Reynolds. Stay safe. Let's get this money.